Welcome to the second presentation of day two of the seminar on developing heritage and nature tourism in the Humberhead Levels and the Ancombe Valley. My name is Ian Rotherham, I'm Emeritus Professor at Sheffield Hallam University. Day two themes uh, include case studies, and in this case, developing tourism and leisure opportunities in case studies, part two, the Ancombe Valley. So we're looking at the Humberhead levels and today looking at the Ancombe Valley. Here's a view of the new river Ancombe, the canalised river from the late 1600s. And it's a fascinating landscape because we know from Dugdale's volume in the 17th century, 1770s, uh, we actually have a map showing the wetlands and the old river going here from the south to the north to the Humber. The old meandering watercourse with its flood meadows and willow cars, and then the new canalised river down the valley. So we've got a good idea of what this landscape was like historically, and it's now been largely drained, and it's a landscape of intensive farming. <clears throat> but in some places, Along the valley bottom, it's quite a narrow valley. Along that valley bottom, uh, very flood prone. The volume that map is from is from Dugdale's History of Embanking and Draining of Diverse Fens and Marshes, both in foreign parts and in this kingdom, and of the improvements thereby. This is from the second edition. We have a, pro a project. Uh, rewilding the Ancombe Valley, and it looks at rewilding, potentially rewetting parts of the Ancombe from deep into Lincolnshire, right the way out to the south bank, the south shore of the Humber Estuary. And one thing that we do know is that this landscape will become wetter in the future with sea level rise, and with climate change. It's already a very low landscape at or about sea level, and it's very flood prone. Some of it is very productive farmland today, but that still takes a huge amount of energy and subsidy to actually get it to deliver um, the food that it produces from that farming landscape. So what we're interested in is whether some parts of the landscape can be allowed to rewild and rewet, and importantly, whether that process can be something that is embedded in a future vibrant farming community. So, finding new ways, imaginative ways, to farm this increasingly wet landscape somewhat differently. In terms of tourism, we have a number of juxtapositions here. We have the Humber itself, which is much improved it's not the polluted river that it once was obviously there's a legacy of historic pollution but it's a much improved landscape and it's teeming with uh, seabirds and estuarine birds we've also got the lincolnshire world to the immediate east which is a gorgeous landscape again it has suffered through uh, intensive farming because the world, the rolling world landscape is susceptible to land improvement and therefore the more natural landscape tends not to persist. But despite that, the, the limey soils, the chalky soils, still produce some really spectacular wildflower meadows and such things. And it's an area with historic villages and churches and old halls which has an established tourism presence. You then have the coastal zone of Lincolnshire further to the east, and again, that has very well established tourism. Well, that tends to be um, mass tourism, and we could probably do a lot more in terms of nature-based tourism. To the west is the uh, Jurassic Ridge, and then, the very urban area of Scunthorpe. The ridge here has some fantastic wooded landscapes. 
uh, and some very pretty villages. Scunthorpe itself has a history of heavy industry as well as history, um, but also it is particularly vulnerable because of its dependence on um, the major steelworks. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of potential for tourism development here. And the other thing, like much of the humble levels, we have very good transport infrastructure into, out of and around much of the landscape. To the south, of course, you move into the heartland of Lincolnshire and the tourism hub of Lincoln itself, high up on the ridge overlooking the area. So there we're looking to the west, towards Broughton and the woods, along the river. This is the canalised New River. And then we've got the Lincolnshire Wells to the east. And it's this river which heads due north to the Humber from the heartland of Lincolnshire. And you go along there and there is almost no traffic. There's no, almost no boats. There are a few people running, walking and cycling, but there's not an awful lot happening. Which is unlike many watercourses, many canalised systems with access along the banks. Um, often have a lot of leisure and recreational use. The actual modern river itself is also very limited in terms of its wildlife potential. The areas to the sides of it, the old the bits of the old watercourse are rather rich, fantastic dragonfly habitat, for example. But the actual main new river has very limited wildlife. And it will be interesting to know why. I have talked to somebody who remembered otters in the area back in the 1950s, but that was a recollection of when they were still being hunted. But otters will undoubtedly now be back because of the decrease in pollution and they've colonised uh, around the region. But it's also likely that there will be mink in the area as well. It's potentially a very attractive landscape. And there you've got the wolves in the distance and it's a big expansive area with relatively few people and little or no tourism activity so it's a kind of untapped resource this is the bottom end where the straight river the new river uh, comes down and then um, releases into the humber estuary that massive estuary that drains the heart of Middle England. And you can see there some of the old industrial uh, plant. And there by the pub, fantastic view across the river. It's really quite a, a dramatic view from the Hope and Anchor, which is a very uh, good restaurant, hotel, um, offering top quality cuisine and experience. And that's the view of the huge Humber Bridge and that dramatic, almost awe-inspiring landscape. And you can see uh, dotted on the, uh, the mud banks and uh, the estuary, flocks and flocks of wading birds, ducks, geese, etc. And close by, a hub for uh, wildlife tourism, Far Ings, fantastic nature reserve and visitor centre managed by the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust. So we've got these hubs which can act as a, um, a platform for developing future and bigger and better uh, tourism impacts. So close by the Humber Bridge and you've got this really quite remarkable nature reserve. You've also not far away got RSPB like Toff Sands, which is, uh, again, it, it's a groundbreaking nature reserve. It's one of the first sites in the region to get birds like Marsh Harrier back and breeding. It's got reedlings, and it was one of the first sites to get uh, avocets breeding in the region. 
So it's a brilliant site and it's very well known to bird watchers. Maybe by networking between different sites and different organizations, the visitor profile of sites like this could be improved and enhanced. But you only have to walk along some of the trackways along the Humber and along the Anco, and you will get good views of birds like marsh harrier and hopefully also in winter maybe hen harriers, buzzards, kites, barn owls and more, possibly short eared owls in winter as well. So these are fantastic places to go and it gives what the public wants, which is a wildlife spectacle. Uh, skeins of geese going overhead, flocks of gulls, flocks of wading birds and uh, a dash of rarities as well. And in summer, the dragonflies, these are fantastic dragonfly habitats. And the whole of the Ancombe Valley appears to be remarkably good because you've got the little remnants of the old river that act as uh, channels to either side and there are little pools and wetlands. And these are teeming with dragonflies. There's also the potential for uh, growing the dragonfly resource because the climate change, new species are moving in. Uh, so new species are arriving from Europe and colonizing the area. And the Ancombe Valley is incredibly well placed to pick up quite good numbers of those new species and not just the odd one, but in abundance. And more and more exotic birds coming in. Now we've struggled to find information on the actual impacts but a few years ago through countryside stewardship or environmental stewardship, some local farmers were helped to uh, allow a number of fields to re-wet along the Anco. And it is suggested that the numbers of birds were completely off the scale. It became a fantastic uh, spectacular. Now, if that can be repeated and presented properly with viewing facilities, then that can be a nature-based hub for future tourism. We've just got to do it. We've got to coordinate in the way that I've talked about in the other presentations. At the moment, it's almost impossible even to get the information on what happened previously or even where it was, because when the stewardship funding ended, the sites were drained. So it would be good to know more about this and to look at what is possible. Our feeling is that um, the valley will get wetter anyway, and we can actually maintain a farming landscape with some wet areas within it. And this can be a platform to diversify not just the biodiversity, but also the local economy and the farming economy to make it more robust, make it stronger, make it more resilient in the face of the changes and challenges that will be coming about. So these are the sort of views that we get um, along these great watercourses. Avocets, the first breeding avocets in the region. And I'm old enough to remember when that was a really spectacular thing to find um, because the only ones we had were down in Suffolk and Norfolk. And then suddenly they started to appear at places like Blacktop Sands. So really quite remarkable. And the fact is that access to birds such as this, well packaged experiences with guides, with viewing points, with hides, with platforms, that will bring visitors and visitors will stay and visitors will spend money. So part of this is about meeting and greeting the visitors, the tourists, but also some of it is about rejuvenating, strengthening, and rekindling the local economy. And that needs resources, hides, visitor centres, shops, toilets, cafes. One of the big barriers, particularly for the, uh, the northern end of the Anco and the former industrial Humber estuary, is a perception of it being an industrial, dirty, derelict, polluted, really quite unpleasant landscape. 
So that is something that we need to look at and to address. And I don't think it's a matter of hiding the fact that it was industrial. You can't hide that as part of the history. It's a little bit like the coalfields area where I grew up, where I still live. You can't pretend it didn't happen, but things move on. And you go to the Humber now and it's spectacular and the wildlife is spectacular. And we need to be shouting about that from the rooftops. But moreover, you need to embed the attractiveness and the attractions in um, good quality hospitality and the sort of things that will draw visitors in. So the industrial past, one of the questions, of course, will be what happens to these sites now they are out of commission, now they're out of use. What will their future be? What will replace them in that land? What will replace them in the economy? And tourism, leisure, sport and recreation are part of the answer. The world to the east is a dramatic landscape with well-established tourism, not without its problems because of intensive farming, but a landscape that has been long settled. So you've got gorgeous old churches and villages, and in some places you still have the remnants of the historic landscape. And again, carefully nurtured, carefully planned, carefully coordinated, that can be part of a basis for a wider tourism development. So we need to think about that. You drop down to the valley bottom, and then you're into the very intensive farming. And whilst I fully understand the demand for cheap food and the drivers that have pushed farming in this direction, I think it's very obvious to anyone with common sense that this is not a system which is long-term sustainable, particularly with the nature of the soils here, the vulnerability to flooding and the undoubted consequence of climate change in the next 30 to 50 years. And you can see there, one of the consequences of intensive farming in these landscapes is simply the soil blowing away. And I even had somebody email me about this who was downwind of those sort of incidents. Their buildings, their washing, their car and everything covered in soil that is simply blown away. That's your future. That's your investment in future food production, that's your investment in future biodiversity, and that is causing pollution on land and in the water when it lands on the water as well. So not a good situation. Throughout the anchor, we have got some potential hubs for tourism. Brig is a gorgeous little market town in the middle of the valley. And surely we can use this as a you know, a, a platform from which a greater tourism industry can lift off. We just need to plan it better and to think how we do it better. This should be a thriving centre for uh, pleasure, craft and biodiversity along the River Anko. Presently, it appears to be struggling. And we have fantastic things like the Brig Heritage Centre. So, you know, we've got some of the resources, we've got some key locations. Or North Lincolnshire Museum in Scunthorpe. Again, a fantastic um, location, dedicated staff, award-winning exhibitions, and it can be a hub from which some of these other things can develop. Market Raisin at the southern end of the Anco. Um, again, really thriving small town and with an established tourism industry because of the races. You know, market raising is famous for that. So surely, again, we can actually find better ways for maintaining the infrastructure, for increasing the quality and embedding it in a more sustainable landscape, a more sustainable nature to bring benefit to all concerned. So our vision is of a wilder, wetter Ancombe, a vibrant, functioning and resilient landscape, a rich biodiversity, sustainable and productive farming, a diverse and robust economy, 
a vibrant, healthy and happy community, engaged and empowered. So that's the future vision. There are some issues and challenges. Connections between nature conservation, heritage, leisure, tourism and regional economic planning remain weak. The local authority North Links planning function and countryside services are not leading in the way that might be hopeful. We had lengthy dialogue with them and promises were made about supporting projects and even commissioning future works on these very issues and nothing at all happened um, and there was zero support for the vision. That was despite initial very positive uh, indications. Now this is difficult because local authorities across the country are under the cosh. We know that I worked in countryside planning in a big local authority and the last 20 years have been dreadful. But this is a downward spiral because if we're missing these opportunities, if these things are not connected, if communities are not supported, if business and local authorities and conservation do not work together, then the future is very, very bleak. And that is a serious problem. Wildlife tourism providers tend, as with tourism providers more generally, to compete, not collaborate when it comes to the visitor economy. They will often collaborate on environmental and nature conservation visions. But when you actually visit a site, it will often not say where you find the sites nearby of the other organisations that are fishing in the same pool. So this is a big issue and it's not specific to conservation and wildlife conservation providers because it's a tourism issue. Generally, what you would do is you would expect the local authority or a tourism agency for a region to provide that connection and that joined up thinking and that overall marketing and promotion. But with the, the way that uh, political decisions have been made, all those bodies, local government and the agencies, have been cut to the core and in some cases completely axed. So there is no overarching organisation to take the different attractions, to take the different attractants, to take the different stakeholders and market them as one. And this is what you need. You need a vision that people sign up for. You need a strategy. How are you going to get there? And you need marketing to promote the image. And then within that, to direct the visitors to the places and to support those providing accommodation, hospitality, information, etc., etc. That is not happening. And this is a, a national problem, but it's reflected particularly acutely in this location. And as with the humble levels generally, the Ancombe Valley and its immediate hinterland perform very badly in terms of leisure and tourism. Individual landowners and agencies have treated the countryside, landscape and nature as a disposable commodity, and they have com compromised the wider sustainable benefits. So we see developments which are not genuinely sustainable. We see approaches to landscape management and agricultural management, which work in the short term and produce very good outputs of food and other products but they are not long-term sustainable. And with climate change particularly, it is becoming more acutely obvious that these are not sustainable. Not only this, by the year 2020, because of government policy and because of international policies, these individual businesses, landowners, agencies, and the local authorities will have to be demonstrably carbon neutral. We'll pause for a thought there. That is quite a challenge. How are they going to do it? The intensive farming is carbon, is hemorrhaging carbon into the atmosphere through fuel, fuel through fertilizers, through pesticides, etc. 
through the degradation of soils, which release carbon into the atmosphere. Where and how is the farming industry going to go carbon neutral? How is it going to offset its current carbon deficit and retain a vibrant future farming for future generations? These are big challenges and it is no good sticking our heads in the sand or in the peat bog like ostriches. Although I don't see many ostriches sticking their heads in the peat bog, but I think you know what I mean. With climate change and other environmental changes, the above are no longer tenable positions. The challenge for the future is to overcome the barriers and reverse the declines. Thank you very much for listening. That's the end of the second presentation of the second day.